We see it all the time. Some of the greatest minds and creatives succumbing to addiction. One very brash one being drug use. In our Jamaican childhood though, drugs or at least hard drugs was not a conversation. Weed, sure. Violence, of course. But drugs such as cocaine or heroin, madness. Or as a Jamaican elder would say, you must drink mad space. Hard drugs were for the movies or for the western world, not fooey little yard. We had 99 problems but drug addictions better not be one. And our athletes dare not bring shame on our country by taking any form of performance enhancement drugs. It was just a no-no for us, or so we naively thought. During research on some of our local artists, we found info as it relates to drug use and abuse, particularly cocaine. Years ago, we thought it was a one-off thing, but that's not the case. A star article titled, I did coke for 10 years. Ninja Man says many artists were hooked on drugs in the 80s. That was published 2017. Speaks of a reality in the entertainment industry many weren't privy to. Let's read a bit from what the article said. So at the time, George Nooks was charged with cocaine possession and Ninja Man, he admitted to the star that he took cocaine for 10 years before developing the strength to ditch the habit. According to the article, the artist said that the habit is mostly practiced by vintage artists since the cocaine epidemic was at its peak in the 80s. Ninja Man, who showed support for George Nooks during the interview, said he is disappointed in the icon. However, he said the public must not be quick to judge. So let's read what he said. It was a serious problem in our days and it eat out people brain. I spent 10 years smoking cocaine and I saw what it was doing to people so I stopped. It wasn't because of no stress in the music business. It was just the thing to do at the time. And I am a madman, so I just do it. It was holding back my career and some artists used to lead me. From a stop smoke cocaine, I was able to take my rightful place in the music industry, he said. And it doesn't stop there. He dropped name. Artists such as Gregory Isaacs, he said, which is known because Gregory Isaacs spoke about it himself and we'll talk about that later in the video. He's saying Banana Man, uh, among a slew of others, whom he said were hooked to the drugs. He also noted that some recorded artists who died violently in the 90s and 80s were killed because of cocaine-related issues. So he continues, Nuff artists where you hear said dead from pneumonia. A cocaine killed them. It is something that is addictive and it was made to destroy the black man. If you sell cocaine, you are working for the devil. And if you are the customer, then it would lead you into the arms of the devil. Rum is also a serious thing that kills brain cells. He said, however, that he did not regret smoking the drug since the experience gave him the knowledge to steer others in a more positive direction. So that's the excerpt that we read from the article. And he has some valid points. Drug epidemic was happening in the 80s and it wasn't just a little yard. U.S all over the world it was just a thing to do they would go to parties and they would have it there like a regular drinks and people would just partake 
I remember watching uh, Michael Jackson doc and he said, or his sister said that they saw the coat there and it was like a regular thing for the party goers and the, the big names and they were seeing it for the first time and that was about the 80s. So it was done. It's just that North Jamaicans never know about it or didn't want to admit to it. Now, another referent article um, comes from the loop, loopnews.com, and it's titled, Jamaican singer says drugs and bad relationships mash up in life. This was published uh, in March of 2018, and his name is Wayne Palmer, and he's desperately, at the time, desperately trying to make a breakthrough in life. He was once a rising entertainer in Jamaica, but he fell on hard times to the point where he considered to take him on life. So upon reminiscing in the article, he spoke about how he used to travel in and out of Jamaica at will. And he literally had fans eating out of his hand. So he scored mainstream success in the 1980s with songs such as King Toby produced Helena Tone and Susie on the Firehouse label. He was a shell of himself at the time when this article was written because it's saying that he spent most of his days at the Kingston waterfront begging for food to survive. He said, things get so rough with me that it is the mercy of God keeping me alive. And he, he even sang Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. And he asked God, when will it be my time again? He said he had really made some bad mistakes in life from choosing um, wrong decisions with past relationships and to you know, turn into drugs at one point in life really mash up, but he said that he wasn't giving up. So here's another reference article. Um, that was published on February in February 2012, and the title is I Survive 11 Years of Hell. And this one is about Clive Hunter, who is a music producer at the Mixing Lab Studio. And he was talking about his story being on the streets of New York, U.S. as a dirty, crappy, foul-smelling bum strung out on cocaine. He calls it 11 years of held torment and unbelievable horror. And he was prior one of Jamaica's most celebrated music icon whose tremendous talent and success took him to the pinnacle of the world. He said that he was a very straight guy and used to say, I would never even work with anyone who did drugs. But one fateful day in 1980 in New York changed that. He was working in studio all day with a fellow famous celebrity who had disappeared after a while. Later that evening, Hunt stormed to the friend's house in anger to find out what had happened to him. He walked in to see a room full of other well-known artists and music musicians all gleefully partying and getting high on cocaine. Someone suggested that he join the fun and his remark was, Nothing can make me behave like Uno. But he tried it. He hated it. And he said it was horrible. The smell, the taste, everything. And give them back. Cuffs and lift. But later that evening, he went by a female friend's house and told her what happened. And here what she said to him. He didn't try it the right way. So she showed him how. From that night, he went from the skyscraper to below the basement. He said it felt like being locked in a nightmare, falling through an endless abyss of black nothingness. He begged for death so many times, 
smoking more coke than any human being should ever ingest. But he said death refused to come calling and he was too cowardly to do it himself. He said he had gotten to the lowest point. There was no lower. I look and smell no different from the man-man on the street. I was roaming the streets of New York, sleeping anywhere, doing anything for a high. I care about nothing but cocaine. Family and friends begged him to get help, even tried to force him, but he remained true to his best friend. He eventually lost everything along with his family and fortune. So he was deported from the U.S. on drug-related charges in 1987 and the streets of Jamaica became his new thing. He's saying that Beris Haman was one of the very few who did not turn their back on him, always offering him somewhere to sleep. Accompanied by a good meal. Big up berries. But that brought rumors for berries because a lot of people were saying that he was doing drugs due to that. But according to Hunt, he never touched the stuff. He was just a really good friend and wanted me to get help. No, he hated himself so much. How he smelled, how he looked, what he was doing to himself, living on the streets, remembering all the success, fame, and fortune that he had. He actually found out one night on the street what a cockroach actually smelled like when one crawled between his nose and lips. Oh. Mm. He continued, I wanted to be saved. I wanted to stop. I knew I just couldn't continue like this anymore. It had to end. In 1991, Hunt checked himself into rehab at Patricia's house in St. Andrew. And that was the beginning of a slow, painful, yet fiercely determined road to recovery. He pointed out that 20 years ago, every studio you go, you would see so many persons doing crack, which had caused the demise of so many persons, some quite famous, but you don't see that now. The sad thing though is now you're seeing a lot more young people doing different types of drugs. Wow. That's something, eh? Did you know all that? You probably saw the articles as there were in our popular local papers. But And some of you were probably aware of what was going on. Um, but it was definitely a problem that several of our musicians face. But these addictions are often with harsh consequences as was illustrated in what we just read. And as Hunt stated, some of the biggest names in the industry did the sea or the snow, with some even saying that they believe that it made them sing better. There's no hard evidence for some of the names called, but as we said, artists such as Gregory Isaacs and Dennis Brown are known to have had drug addictions. The movies have shown us, with fame, money, pressure and stress, creatives often turn to something to help them manage these dynamics and expectations. For some, it might have started out as a fun or cool thing to do, but try it once or a few times and suddenly you're hooked, often doing it against your conscious will. Most drugs affect the affect the brain's circuit by flooding it with the chemical messenger dopamine telling you that it feels good but in reality it's damaging eating you away not just physically but mentally 
one's character might even begin to fade with drug abuse causing some to do extreme things to contain uh, to continue their use and sometimes unlike what they would have done drug addiction is said to be a brain disorder because it involves functional challenges and changes to the brain circuits involved in reward stress and self-control if you watch the series snowfall you'll see a few of the beloved characters such as wanda and melody spiraling into drug use and how it enslaved their dreams health and self-control and this brings to mind our very own beloved gregory isaacs we're going to read a little bit about him now, Gregory Isaac's cool ruder was born on July 15, 1951, in Demonton, Kingston. He started doing music since his teenage years, entering several competitions. His first single recorded title, Another Heartache, sold poorly. Isaacs went on to team up with Errol Dunkley to start the African Museum record label and shop and soon had a hit with My Only Lover, credited as the first lover's rock record ever made. By 1974, he had his first Jamaican number one single called Love Is Overdue and by the 80s, Isaacs was a local and international name. In 1982, he gifted the world the hit Night Nurse. And here's an interesting fact about Night Nurse. Hit had recently had a million, 100 million streams on Spotify. And in January, it was certified silver for sales exceeding 200,000 units in the UK. The certification was issued by the British Phonographic Industry, which is BPI. Initially, Night Nurse was not a chart hit in either the UK or US. It was popular in clubs and received heavy radio play. And the album reached number 32 in the UK. It was also used in adverts for an over-the-counter uh, cold and flu remedy of the same name. It is said with success came, came Gregory Isaac's um, affairs with cocaine. He served a six-month prison sentence in Kingston in 1982 for possession of unlicensed firearms. And he claimed that he had the weapons only for protection. But it emerged that this was his 27th arrest and that he had become involved in drug dealing and was addicted to crack cocaine. The Gleaner reports his wife June speaking of his addiction. She said, It started as an accident. He hid it from us all. I accidentally found out. However, it got to the point where he started to do it in the room with me just lock up and smoke we were not educated a lot about cocaine at the time i was helpless not knowing what to do no he smoked it not inject it because the high was faster and although he was open with his smoking june said that it was not something they shared as coming from a christian background she has never smoked his wife noticed the mood shifts. She said, I was see, seeing a whole different person. He would be happy one minute, then he changed. The paranoia was terrible. He would be cool with you one minute, then you were an enemy. All of a sudden, you were wondering, who is this person? Now it said that he, Gregory Isaacs, resisted efforts to get him off crack. His wife said, we tried, but pride and all that. He would not go to a rehab place or he would do the treatment for a few days and stop. Throughout it all, Gregory was still writing and recording. He was functional. He was doing shows. 
However, his wife said that the promoters them they get fed up. He would miss flights. They would have to reschedule several times. He was doing albums a lot, not high quality, to maintain the habit. She also said at home he lived up to his family responsibilities, looking after the kids, the house's mother. She calls it an elect jog at the time. She said it was an uptown pastime. And she's saying that some did not know better, so she has no anger for that. There is not one I would point a finger at and blame them for everything. She later stated it reaching a breaking point for her. She just couldn't take it anymore. She said no, it was unbearable. She said it was about 2006 or 2007. Them they lived in the same house, but in the one side and she the one side. And them times that it's really rough. It is reported that Isaac's drug addiction had a major impact on his voice, with most of his teeth falling out as a result. Gregory said of his addiction in 2007, drugs are the basing weapon. It was the greatest college ever but the most expensive school fee ever paid, the cocaine high school. I learned everything, and now I've put it to the side. Gregory stated that his addiction destroyed friendships, compromised his Rastafarian ideals, complicated his life with his family, damaged bonds, and eventually even almost destroyed his musical gift. Sadly and very unfortunately, Gregory, Gregory Isaacs passed at his home in London. He was just 59 years old at the time. So that's a lot to take in, a lot to unpack. We try to do it as concise as possible with reputable articles uh, and references. Um it's kind of shocking and we we could say that we wanted a different way for a lot of the creatives and the great minds and so forth but it happened it's history and hopefully we can learn something from it hopefully this generation and generations after will learn something from it i will not take similar or same paths as it relates to addictions because we see the clear consequences Hearing from them themselves, how it affected them, damaged their lives, their health, and for some, they even lost everything. We hope you find this valuable and we have so much coming your way. Do remember to subscribe, share, comment, let us know what you're thinking and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay safe, stay blessed, take care of yourself enough and each other. And blessings always. Big up with Jamaican and international family. <laughs>